from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which, which you heard it was coming and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and, they, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whomever, whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So let's look at what John is saying here in the back up. And John is making some very interesting, and, and it's uh, very interesting statements here. And it's interesting from the perspective if you really understand uh, how conversations are done and, and looking at how they are held. And it's interesting in our day and time, this lesson, when we talk about conversation, how men are choosing to change up words and the meaning of words. And there's a reason behind a lot of that. And, we, and I wish we had a lot of time to get into that, but we, we have a lot of things we want to cover here. But... But just, just keep in mind and keep in, in the back of your mind and watch how men change things and how things, in fact, what we used to consider to be normal now is oftentimes considered abnormal. And things that are abnormal are considered to be normal. For an example, and I, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, for an example, as Mary and I were traveling a little bit, we went to some places where I couldn't tell you whether it was a man or a woman. And then there was restrooms that you go into that everybody went into. I mean, it's kind of like, whoa. When that used to be what? It used to be abnormal. You had, a, you had and they still have signs to say men and women. And, 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 and in fact, one time it was illegal for a man to go into a woman's dressing room. But anyway, just keep that in mind as we look at this lesson and we talk about these things. But notice here. And, and what we have to do, it says, do not believe every spirit. He says, but test the spirit. So we see that it's important as Christians to be willing to do some what? Test. Now, when you do test, what, what's required to do a test? Study. You have to know the proper results and know so they know if the test is going to be true or not. Anyone else? So there has to be some standards, right? There has to be something that you have to have established as what is what? Acceptable and true, right? And then you can judge everything else to it. So Christians are supposed to be ones who are willing to do that. And we're supposed to be willing to do that in everything. And so we, we, can't, we can't look at, we can't, we can't stop and say, well, we can only do that from a uh, religious perspective or only when it comes to worship service, but we have to do that in every aspect of our lives. We have to always be willing to pursue what the truth is. Notice why. He says, to see whether they are from God. You see, so you have to know whether it's from God. You can't accept it because there's a lot of things, that's what he's trying to get him to understand. There's a lot of folks who are confessing Christ, but don't really believe that Christ is from God. And so you got to do, you got to take some tests. So just because I get up and start teaching this class doesn't mean you need to accept what I'm saying, but you should be running some tests to see whether the things that I say, remember now, Apostle Paul explained, or at least he tells us in Acts, I shouldn't talk about it, in Acts in 17 in verses 11, it says what? The Thessalonians, they did what? They went back and they searched the scripture to see, or the bereavers, the bereavers, you correct? They searched the scripture to see if those things were what? 
so are true. And so when we teach, then you need to go back and check that out and verify for yourself to see if that is correct. Now notice, why? Because you want to know it's from God. Because every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now I want you to notice something there while I'm underlining that. Because this confession here is more than just a confession of the mouth. I want you to understand that this confession here. So just because I say with my mouth that Jesus is Christ, it's not this confession here. That's part of it. But then you have to look at what? You have to look at the life. And then you have to see what? If it aligns with the truth. Is it aligned with the scriptures? You see, that's what the test is. And every Christian should have that test. That's why I put up there, Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, he says we have to test everything and hold fast to that which is good. You see, so you have to verify that which is good. And then you hold fast to that. Notice something else here he says in here. He said, little children, you are from God. What does that mean when he's saying that? Kevin, you got your hand up? Well, I was going to comment on what you had said just a, a second ago about, you know, you said looking at our lives as opposed to this year's not being uh, uh, a church. And that's our warning to let us know that everything that we, we read and we hear and we see has to be tested. But also, see, it's like we, we have to be able to compare that which we hear and take and, and project the outcome of what's being taught. Because people can take the scriptures like you're talking about and turn when, when and how God can bless those who, like he blessed Abraham and how he blessed uh, Isaac and Jacob and, and blessed Solomon. And we can they can take that and turn it to a prosperity gospel. Okay, where well the prosperity gospel still doesn't line up with what the Bible teaches. So we have to be able to see that because Jesus said, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink. The prosperity gospel, it's not wrong that God can prosper us, that's true. But that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is for us to place our dependence on God. And then through our dependence in God, God blesses us. So the emphasis is always on us concentrating our hearts and our minds to the will of God. You know? So we have to be able to see that through the teaching. Because sometimes, uh, like I say, uh, the Apostle Paul so, says... So we want to get into that a little bit more later on, right? No, no, you, you're doing good, but, you, but you're really a little bit ahead of us. Yeah, but, no, but, but you're on the right, he's on the right path, but he's just a little bit ahead of us. And that we want to look at is because I want you to see here something that's important, I think, when it says you are from God. He's our creator. He knows us. And he made us. Now let me ask you a question. If I said to Brother Dansby, you are from the Air Force, what does that mean to you? You was in the Air Force, right? And as, as being from the Air Force, you had to do what? When you was in the Air Force, what you had to do? You had to work. You had to pay attention. But then, but, 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 but I'm going to go a little bit further because I want y'all to get this now. Because every once in a while I go out and I see people that's from the Air Force. Now, how do I know they're from the Air Force? Say it again. They are in their uniform. And then when they're in their uniform, what do I know about them? They're in the Air Force, but they have to wear it a certain way. You see, they can't just wear it. Now, y'all help me. Now, y'all were in the Air Force. A couple of y'all was in there. Y'all help me if I'm wrong. But you just couldn't put on the, on the uniform and wear it any kind of way. I noticed that when they walk in the buildings, they take off the hat. When they walk back outside, they put the hat back on. Why? Because they are representatives of the Air Force. And their conduct has to be coming of the Air Force. 
Otherwise, when they get back, they will have some problems. Isn't that correct? Because I want to understand this. So now I want you to understand something. He says, you are from God. Therefore, once you are from God, you put on a uniform. You have to conduct yourself. Uh -oh. Why? Because you are representing God. You're no longer just representing yourself. But you're a representative of God. So there's a way you must conduct yourself. Here's something else. And if you conduct yourself like God has approved, then I know you are from God. So then you have to ask yourself, why do we struggle with people knowing who we are? Now, I have to say this one other thing, and I'll move on. Because I know i move on. But, but I remember, and, and some of the folks that went to, to BTW at that time, that they used to have a band director, and his name was Mr. Gerard. And it didn't matter when they band had their uniforms on. They had to have it on correctly, completely, no matter where they were and what they were doing. They couldn't just, un it, get, it was a little high kept, and they just couldn't unbutton it. It had to remain unbuttoned until you go and take the whole uniform off. And, I, and people used to talk about that and criticize him, but now today when I go up to the school and I see young men and young women wearing their uniform, I look at what they look like. And I say, hmm, I know Mr. Gerard ain't here anymore. <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd put throw that in there. It says, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Why? He said, because we are from God. So it's important that we remember that we are from God, and as a result of that, we are representative of him. Notice what he says here, too. <clears throat> Jesus says, for whomever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be us also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, and with the holy angels, Mark 8 and 38. Why is that important? He's saying that if you do the test and you prove that which is true, you can't keep silent about it. I know y'all got quiet on that one. You see, we are silent on a lot of things in today's environment because everything is not politically expedient for us to talk about. I'm glad y'all quiet now because that's what, right? You know, we, we got all kind of reason. We got all kind of reason not to t talk on anything because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, we say. But I wonder is that we are ashamed of who we are.
for the problem. They don't, sometimes they don't talk. <laughs> yeah, they find out later on. But that's the whole, but, that, but, but, but my point is, and I get what you're saying. My point is, is that we don't oftentimes, we, we live in an environment where we now, we, we fear confrontation. Everything is taught about being what? Tolerant. Everything is, you have to be, you know, we have, it, it, I, don't, I might make some of you mad here, but even in church, we have to be quiet on certain things. We walk around on eggshells. Because somebody will get their feelings hurt. They get mad, they won't come back. They say all kinds of things, and then we get to where we don't want, we don't want our feelings hurt. So I'm just, that's what Jesus said. He said, because that's what he meant by, and I'm, I don't get it, that's what he means by being ashamed. Because if you remember, and, I, and I'm, I'm not, I, and again, make sure you understand that, I'm, I'm nowhere near the first person, maybe not even the thousandth person to say this. When we first obeyed the gospel, we couldn't wait to go tell them. What happened? You, is the world don't need to change now. But then let me say one other thing, and I'm going to get your hand, I'm going to say this too. But then we got to also understand that, yes, we have to teach people about the church, but that's part of the truth. Your lifestyle changed. We're going to get into it. That's where we get into problems. So, and I'm going to say this, I got to move on, but we're going to be out of time, so we got to start a little bit late, too. But, but, but now, here's something else you want, I just, I'm just, since Kevin did it, I'm going to follow Kevin. Food for thought, I'm throwing this out there. <laughs> Everything you see around us today is being protested. Who's protesting for Christ? Who's walking around with signs for Christ? Who's, who's walking and marching for Christ? Yeah, but you got something started. Go ahead. That they were afraid. Like sometimes when I talk to my children, they're all grown, 40s, well, 50s, and 60s. Well, Mom, I don't want to hear that right now. That's not in my, <laughs> that's not in my timeline. Right. So, it's, you know, we don't, don't want to be confronted. Don't want to be told the truth. That way you have to change your lifestyle. That's right. And, 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 and you're so right. In fact, we're going to get into this. And so why is it essential for Christians to learn the distinction between truth and error, Brother Dan. to believe, but then the problem becomes, and this is what John is getting to is, it get diluted. It get diluted because we start to what? Bring in our tradition. We start to what? Come up with how we feel about it. We start diluting the truth. So much so that nobody really wants to know the truth. In fact, the author brings it out in his lesson. He says in Jeremiah, what he says in the fifth chapter, he says what? The prophets started prophesizing false things because the people loved it so. Which is interesting in our lesson because we all want to be loved. 
We all want all these things. And so, so that's why it's, it's difficult. In fact, I'm asking the question here is, why is it essential for us to learn to distinguish between the truth and error? I'll throw this in there for you too. It's going to become even harder as the days come ahead. And I'm not necessarily here talking against artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence is going to do some things that's going to make it even more difficult. They can put some things out there on artificial intelligence and make you think that was Vince. And Vince didn't say nothing. But anyway, that's, that's so. But so why is it so thing? True followers of God are identified by their pursuit and obedience of the truth. You see, you have, to be, you have to be interested in seeking the truth, and once you find it, you have to be what? Obedient to the truth. Many of us are interested in finding the truth, at least what we want to believe is the truth, and then when we find that the truth may be something different from what we thought it to be, we go about what? rationalizing and finding a way to change and modifying what was the truth. Here's the thing that we got to remember. Here's the thing John trying to get us to understand. There are many deceivers in the world. That's the problem. It's the deception. That, that, that want to make us think they're one thing when in fact they're something else. And here's what's so really scary about it. Satan himself has disguised himself as an angel of light. So much so that you can't even identify him. He might look even better than some of us that's supposed to be Christians. Because he knows how to put the uniform on. But he puts a little bit of something else in there. Right? But freedom comes from knowing the truth. You see, you, you can't, see, you, you can't deceive, you, 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 you shouldn't deceive yourself. You should want to know the truth, regardless of what it may declare. The truth may be that I'm not looking or I'm not doing what I need to do. Once I identify that, I need to do what? Make the change. Stop fighting against the truth, but make the change. Y'all remember the story about the old wicked witch who said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? You know, I think sometimes we, we do that. And when the mirror tells us something that we don't want to hear, we latch out at others, right? Y'all get that later. But true worshipers are commanded to worship in spirit and in truth. You see, so to be a true worshiper, you have to both worship in the spirit but you have to make sure it's true. A lot of folks put a lot of emphasis on getting the spirit. They want to get the spirit. They want to be spirit-filled. And they, they come in and they testify how spiritual they were and how they was led and fed with the spirit, and which is good. But if it's not based in truth, then you're not a true worshiper. I, I can't change that. That's not what I prefer. It's not what I want, but it's what God has established. You see, the time will come when there'll be true worshipers. What we have to do is make sure that we are those true worshipers. Right? But let's try to get on to this. So, so the matter of love, I like how the author puts it. He says the matter of love is the center of Christian life. It is the source, it is sourced in God. Demonstrating by God and commanded by the Lord to his church 
However, love must be understood in a comprehensive way. Only by doing so can we fully appreciate the need for it in every aspect of, of Christian living. So now, we can all agree what the world need is love, right? We can see that by some of the acts that we see. But it's, the devil has taken even that love and made it confusing. For an example, when we ask the question, what is love? You go to the dictionary, you find in true love, both partners recognize and value each other's individually, individuality, opinions, and feelings. They listen without judge, judgment and show consideration for each other's needs and wishes. Respect and true love means treating each other with kindness and honor and even in, even in disagreement. And we all would be happy with that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be happy with that? From a Bible's perspective, the Bible, first off, John, he tells us, that he said that God is love. And we will all be satisfied with that, right? Nothing wrong with those things. We will be happy about those things. However, how can we be misguided by these two definitions? How can we be misguided? Thank you, right? Not only that, but let's take that a little bit further. You see, the author brings this out too. God is more than just love. He is love, but more than that. God is also holy. God is also pure. God, God also expects certain things out of us. God is righteous. God is endless. You see, so when you, you, can, you can pick out one, uh, if I can break it down to you like this, if you can look at me, you can pick out one characteristic of mine, but that's, that, and that describes something about me, but that's not all me. And that's what we do with that when we say God is love. Now, why is that useful? Because I can come back and do what Brother Dansby just talked about, a little bit of what Kevin is talking about, because now I can use that to manipulate you to say, you should be willing to accept me as I am. So if I feel like 
I'm this. And even though that might not be right, and then I say, in your eyes, God accepts me as I am. Well, that, that was people, and we have to understand that sometimes because people don't accept the truth, that God goes ahead and let you be as you are. If you don't believe me, go read Romans, the first chapter, and read on down all the way through verses about 31, and you'll find out what God does let people do. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we look around our environment and we see what we see today. Because people are rejecting God. And God tells us what he'll do when we reject him. And then the other thing is, it is so, uh, if you will, welcoming to us how Satan likes to make us feel good about our sin. You see, and, and, I, and I don't want you to misunderstand it. I'm not trying to make you uh, uh, feel bad about yourself. But you, you should understand what you, what you should be looking at to make yourself feel good about yourself. You see, I shouldn't just feel good about myself because I got this suit on today. I should feel good when I know I have crisis uniform on under this suit. You see, if I got the suit on on the outside and the uniform is not on correctly on the inside, then I'm messed up. Let me, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you how I know that's to be the truth. You see, I can sit up in here and stand up in here right now and I'm looking at you and I look maybe look good, strong, and healthy on the outside. But there's some things going on the inside that maybe I don't even know about. And so that's what we have to look at as Christians. We have to be looking on the inside because that's what God looks at, the inside. Yes, sir. Fine. How can I love God and not love myself? How can you love God? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you don't love yourself, then you don't love God. All right? You, so, and I don't know, I, mean, I probably should ask you some more questions to make sure I understand what it is you were meaning by that. So let, help, help me understand where you're going with that. So let me, let me, let me, let me, if I go a little bit further and, and, and make sure I want to make sure I'm being a little bit more clear what I'm saying there, is that, first of all, you have to recognize that God made you, right? And so that God put life in you, and he's put his spirit in you. But now, the thing that should make you love yourself is knowing that God loves you, and when you have a relationship with him, right? Right? So when you've got a relationship with him, then, now, Here's why people started having problems with themselves. You see, they have rejected the truth of God, and they begin to look at themselves, right? Even to the fact that you can even look at yourself and you can become in love with yourself. So much so that you think you, you are either better than God or yet you are God. Now you went too far in loving yourself. So you have to be careful and looking at what you're looking at, right? So, so I hope that helps everybody in, in terms of that. I think you got your hand up over there, brother. And it, there's also, too, a difference in being disappointed with self and not loving self. Because God placed in everybody an inherent desire for self-preservation. That's part of our human might makeup. So if we, if we look at the word of God and we see how we stand shy of it, our self-preservation, if we have an eye toward God, is to correct that. That's what's supposed to be the natural instinct. But like you say, when we don't love God, when we don't have any respect for anything, then man takes over. And that's how you see people do all these uh, evils that they do because they're not directed by God. But if we have a mind toward pleasing God and we know that we, we're condemned, that's why God gives us a consequence. So that in our understanding of the consequence, 
our mode of self-preservation is supposed to kick in and have us to try to live a life that's pleasing to God. So that's how it's supposed to work. Anyway. Um, but remember, the deceiver can take those things and use them against us. That's why I want to be clear on that. You see, because that's the reason why people do some things they do is they do it out of what they think to be love. And they think because they're doing it out of love, then therefore they is acceptable because of God because God is in love. When in, when in actuality, you are not loving yourself. Right? So see, what, here's where we miss this. Now, I'm going to try to make it if I can. Here's where we miss this. Now, if I was to do physical harm to myself, all of you would readily identify that that's not right. And, and if I was going to do it right here in front of you, most of you, or some of you anyway, would run up here and try to stop me. Say, don't hurt yourself. You're hurting yourself, right? But when we do spiritual harm to ourselves, who says something? Who identifies it? Who, who comes to my rescue when I'm harming myself spiritually? Who warns me? Who pleads with me not to do that? Who look at it as if, Henry, you are taking your own life. You're committing suicide. Don't do it. But we have come into a, mis a misunderstanding of the truth in that now we're told that, well, that's what he wants to do. You got your hand up? See how the devil is cunning, too, because, like I said, you can be doing spiritual harm to yourself, but the devil can reward you with monetary gain. Okay, so, so you're doing this spiritual harm to yourself, but the devil tells you that's the, that's the thing to do, and we can see that with all the stuff that's going on in the news today. You know, people being rewarded doing ungodly things uh, and, and they supposedly think that they're, that's in their best interest, which actually is not. That's just the deceit of the devil. That's so true. So now go back to what we started with. Is our memory works. You remember what it was? Anybody remember? Ephesians 6 verse 12. We're fighting against what? The powers and principalities of darkness in high places. Not against each other. You see, the problem is when we started talking about truth, we get into a combative situation with one another. We wrestle with each other. We're upset with one another. So much so that we can't even have a, 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 a logical or reasonable conversation with each other because we get mad, we get upset, and we get offended. When we have to say, wait a minute, we need to, we need to learn how to have a conversation to understand is, it's not you that I'm really trying to take this out against. So it's not you, but it's what? It's the evil that I'm trying to get you to recognize. That's what we have to do, brothers and sisters. And the only way we can do that is when we use the scripture. Our problem is we get too much of our opinions in the thing. So we get to talking with one another. You see, in fact, since y'all take me down this path, there was a time that when we used to talk about things, especially religious things, we say, well, brother, give me chapter and verse. <coughs> Don't tell me about what you read in the Bible. Don't tell me to go hunt for it. If you're going to tell me that I got to do this, give me chapter and Bible. I mean, give me book, chapter, and verse. That's what we used to do. But we all got a little lazy, right? <laughs> well, I'm I'm just saying, the reality of it is, again, we got to remember that, as the author says, and Kevin has also brought it out too, that there are many false prophets. And if we're not careful, we can become one of them. 
if we are not following specifically chapter and book. Seeking to purify our sin, right? stay with where the God just gave us. Now, no doubt, this young man standing there, he had on the right color. He was in the right place. He was in the right formation. And I imagine if you questioned him further, he wouldn't see anything wrong with what he had done. But was he right? And that's the thing about us as Christians. And that's what I want you to see here. The, the, the evil one or the deceiver or convince us there's nothing wrong with what we do. It's a little bit different. It's not the uniform that was issued, but I got on blue pants. What should it matter? Now, let's take that and, con and bring that to the church. This morning we were in worship service. I'm here. I'm dressed. What if my heart is just not in the right place? What difference does it make? And I'm here, and I'm in the right place. I'm in the right time. I'm in the right uniform. But there's a problem. You, you got in the right, but that's the problem, right? And he wasn't in the right uniform. But I have convinced myself that I am. That's the point I want. You got what I want us to get that we convince ourselves because the devil gets us to understand it's about intentions. God understands. That's why he uses that scripture. We use it for one thing when we read over there in Hebrews 7, uh, Hebrews the fourth chapter, around by, I think, it, verse 12, when it said God, he judges the intent, right? We take that a little bit further. We say, well, God knows my heart. So what does it matter if I was attempting to do, but I didn't? That's what I need us to get at. Is that's why he says, examine yourself. Know whether you're in the spirit. You, we need to be about examining ourselves and examining one another. Testing the spirit to know whether or not we are from God to know or not whether it is from God. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. That's what Satan wants us to misunderstand. I wish they had a little bit more time. I'm sorry we got started a little bit late, later in it. Uh, Kevin, I already kind of touched upon a little bit about some examples of some false teaching today. 
But I want us to understand that, yes, we are commanded by God to love one another. And he tells us that if we love one another by this, all men will know that we are disciples. So if we want to know, we want people to know that we are from God, we ought to start to love one another. Amen. Amen. Amen.